kind of what we want, kind of in the way that we want it. We just need to tweak it a bit. So let's look at the building blocks, because obviously not everyone here knows what Selenium is. Selenium is a, a tech stack, it's very much the key of this tech stack um, that does UI automation. What do I mean by that? Well, if you tell your computer, press this button, then it presses the button without you having to click the button. Simple, right? Everyone gets that? Yes? Cool. Um, Selenium features a server client architecture. Um, it supports many languages. It has cross-platform support, so all the things that we need, which is interesting and exciting. So Selenium definitely needs to be part of our stack. On top of Selenium, I've discovered there's another thing called Appium. Appium takes Selenium and makes it very much app-specific. So something about Selenium, one of the great disadvantages perhaps is that it's very web-centric. So it's meant for you to test your websites. But as it turns out, a website isn't so different from a modern application anyway. So you can apply much of the same concepts to desktop or mobile applications. And that's what Appium does. It's basically sitting on top of Selenium. Then behind Selenium sits a thing called the web driver. It's essentially the server part of the client server architecture of Selenium. The web driver executes whatever action it's being told to execute. So when you tell your computer, press that button, it's not Selenium doing it, it's the web driver doing it. Um, the web driver is a W3C spec. Um, it's super well defined, uh, awkwardly well defined, I might say. Goes into great detail about all the API things. Um, but it defines an API for automation, which is important because now we have something that we can write against, right? Um, and so the last building block that we need is ATSPI. Uh, now, who here does not know what ATSPI is? Okay, so ATSPI is kind of the core technology for assistive uh, stuff on Linux. So all the accessibility stuff essentially runs through ATSPI. ATSPI is uh, mostly a DBus protocol that establishes how this communication has to happen and what APIs need to be provided. But um, um, the toolkits are the ones implementing that. And so through the toolkits, every application on the Linux desktop, more or less anyway, already gets ATSPI support. Does that, is everyone on board with that? Yeah, cool. But wait, wait, wait. So <laughs> I've added accessibility to this picture now, which is um, interesting. It's also very important. So ex accessibility has an overlap with automation in that it wants to do much the same things. It needs to inspect what is on the screen. It needs to interact with what is on the screen. It needs to click a button um, from our example. So it's about having the computer manipulate its own state, very much like we need for testing. And so by building on top of the accessibility stack, we get all this automation capability and at the same time, we use our accessibility features implicitly. So now suddenly we realize that there are accessibility problems, that sometimes things are not annotated, that they are not correctly named, that they do not have a name at all perhaps, that they are not interactable. All these things that accessibility asks of us as sort of extra curricular work from the developer, we usually don't notice it because we don't use accessibility. But if we do testing through accessibility, now it becomes a different story because we're using it. So we can put all these building blocks, all the trees together and form a lovely forest. You can see the forest right there, it's a bit foggy. <laughs> so we have a bunch of client libraries and we have a bunch of HTTP and JSON in the middle and then we have ATSPI on the end and somewhere there's an application then. So uh, essentially it looks like this in black and white because the slides are in black and white. But what, what, what is this? Web driver, why do, why do you not have an icon? Oof, big question mark there. Something is missing, the web driver, the web driver bit. So the actual thing that does the work, right? That is missing because there's no such thing for ATSPI. We need a web driver that is capable of receiving Selenium requests and then translating that to ATSPI requests. And that's the thing I did. So if you check it out on Invent, that would be cool. Um, it essentially handles the communication between Selenium and the actual entity under test. So if you start kcalc and test kcalc, then uh, the web driver will be talking to kcalc through ATSPI. So now all the protocols are well defined and we're super independent of one another because if Selenium should f fall by the wayside, we can just write our own Selenium or pick something else up. And we maintain the web driver, so that's lovely. And ATSPI can be switched out for another technology. And now that is interesting because now you couldn't technically write a test that runs on Windows and on Linux. Isn't that exciting? Ah, ah, ah. It's, not, it's not there yet, so don't get too excited. <laughs> So our web driver does a bunch of things. First of all, it does this translation between Selenium and ATSPI and all that. Um, it also comes with a start wrapper, so you don't have to manually set up your, your execution environment because we need to spin up a bunch of stuff. You know, your ATSPI daemon, your Dbus daemon, your what, whatever other daemon you might possibly want. And the web driver takes care of that. 
Um, it's also able to create video recordings, and that's because of a design decision that we've made. So ordinarily, you would run the application on your actual system, right? But we wanted a bit of confinement, but not too much confinement. We essentially wanted to be able to manipulate the input of the application without impacting the input that you are actually doing. So what we're doing is we're spinning up a nested Quinn Wayland session within your existing session. So you can be running X11, but it will be spinning up a uh, Wayland window. And inside that window, we can do whatever input manipulation we want without affecting anything on the outside, which is pretty cool. But it also affords us the opportunity to um, do screen recording super easily, thanks to work that Alex has done in the past year. So that's pretty cool. Um, we can also do, of course, uh, screenshots, for example. Uh, obviously, if we can do a video, we can do screenshots. Oh, live demo time. Ooh, ooh, ooh. This is gonna, this is gonna be exciting. Also because I don't actually see it. So here we go. Uh, uh, it's obviously not live because I'm not, I'm not uh, <laughs> I've been burned before, my friends. But we're using a very experimental video player. What? Well, it is, I'm, I'm live right here, right? <laughs> So yeah, so this is a video um, of a test. Quinn Wayland started up, K Info Center is starting up, it's typing in stuff and then it's asserting stuff and then it goes away again. Um, that was obviously a bit quick, so maybe let's do it a bit slower. Um, so what it's doing now is it's looking for the search field and it goes, do I find a search field? Hello, search field, where are you? And the search field goes, oh, here I am. <laughs> and so it selects the search field, it's hard to see, but it's now selected. And now it starts typing. So that's input synthesis uh, through Quinn Wayland. So no actual typing is occurring there. And uh, now it's loaded the CPU module and it's asserting, is it actually the CPU module? Is it selected in the list view and all that? And that's the end of the test. Let's look at another one. Right, it's a big surprise. What is, what's the test? Oh, it's the media album thingamajigs from Plasma. Um, this is a super involved test actually on the backend side because we're, we are provisioning uh, an entire fake uh, Dbus uh, Empress service just to test this thing. It's pretty amazing on the back end, even if it doesn't look it, but I need to show you something. And then here we have a test in Discover, I think. And don't get distracted by all the debug messages. This is an experimental version of Dragonplay, and I forgot to remove the debug messages. So um, it again searched for the search field. It's typed in calcium. It opened calcium. It's gonna click on the install button any minute now. Now it's installing Calcium. Should only take a couple seconds, hopefully. Well, of course it does, it's recorded. So, right, so now it's installed, it can be launched, and now it's uninstalling it again. It's a very simple test, but a very important test because this is a core workflow. If this breaks, then what's the point of Discover? Alrighty, let's look at some code. What kind of code do you want to see? Test code or driver code? Very good. Very good selection, my friends. Okay, is it large enough? Okay, so here's some simple setup for the test. Um, setting up the repositories for Flatpak and whatnot, blah, 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 standard test setup stuff. Then it's creating a web driver, it's here. It's on uh, the local host, it's a service that is spun up by our run wrapper that is part of the driver. So that's like boilerplate stuff that just goes into every test. Indeed, most of the stuff go is boilerplate. So this teardown, st teardown stuff is also boilerplate, it's taking a screenshot and quitting the driver. Nothing particularly interesting. So this is actually where the logic happens, right? Um, so first of all, we have a wait condition. For 30 seconds, we're gonna wait for the loading label to disappear. So here it says label loading. That's like a special type of string, a descriptive string uh, from ATSPI that basically defines the type of what you're looking for and the current label that it carries. There are various lookup methods. This is one of them and by far the simplest. Um, actually, no, the simplest is just using the name, I think. So in this case, we're being a bit more explicit. We're saying it needs to be a label and it needs to have the uh, string loading. Next, we're looking for a search field. So we're doing a simple find element call and looking for the search field. 
we are making sure that the search field gets focused and assert that state. Now that we have the search field focused, we can input the keys calcium and hit enter. And then again, we have a wait condition for 30 seconds for the data to actually load, blah, blah, blah. Same thing repeats. We wait until the list item calcium appears, and then we click on it. At this point, we're doing a bunch of assertions, so we're looking for the application description and making the very uh, useful assertion that the description is actually not empty. So the length would be greater than 64. Um, next, we're looking for a push button, and the push button should say install from Flutter user, and then we're gonna click on it, and then we're gonna wait for 120 seconds. That's always the maximum amount of time that we're waiting. It's not a regular sleep, right? Uh, we're looking for a push button, it's gonna do remove, blah, blah, blah. Same dance again, we're again waiting until the install button appears again. Exciting code, right? It's super boring. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's a test, right? What did you expect? Uh, come on. Let's maybe look at another one. Which one? There are really no exciting tests, unfortunately. Um, oh, we can look at this one. So this is the, the super exciting one that I was talking about because it has its own Empress uh, player implementation as part of the test. So I'm not gonna go through this, but it's like a lot of work. Fushan did the work, it's super, super awesome. Um, so it's, setting, it's using JIO to set up an, an, an entire server as part of the test and then somewhere hopefully there would be the test case. Yeah, so all that stuff was just the setup, right? So here's the actual test case. And uh, I've, I think if you've read a couple of lines, you already have a feel for how simple this is. It's really not magic. So again, we're looking, we're finding an element. This time we're just looking for it to say play. We're not asserting that it has any specific type in this case. Then we're looking for the previous button, the next button, the shuffle button, the repeat button. And then we're gonna do some uh, matching and probably some assertions at some point. We're gonna do a click on a button. So you can also um, look for a button in the UI, then hold it as a variable in your test and re later reference it again. So this previous button here, uh, well, play button has been defined all the way at the top and now it's being used again. And you can use it as long as its lifetime um, is valid, right? Yeah, that's about it. What else can we look at? System tray test. Oh, that one is also interesting because it actually implements a system tray. Uh, an X embed uh, tray icon. So um, essentially, uh, I think the use case for this was uh, the X embed icons broke in one of the recent Plasma releases and so Fushan added this test um, which adds an X embed tray icon and then asserts that it's actually there. Uh, let's have a look, see. Right, so here he's starting the X embed as an I proxy. Blah, 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 test waiting for a bit. So this is actually the only important line in this entire exercise is the presence of an element located by its title, right? That's the only thing that we want to assert. If the plasma system tray is loaded and an X embed application is also running, we should see an icon. And at the end of the day, ideally this should be the only thing you need to write, but of course being X embed, it needs more setup logic. Okay, anything else? Any wishes? I have a calculator test that is fascinatingly boring. Let's have a look. Okay, so it clears, it, clears the, it clears everything, it puts seven in, it checks that the result column says seven, then it does calculations, it's amazingly simple. And so what are some of the gotchas? Um, or actually, let's look at something else first. Let's go to my slidey slides. 
we've been here and here and here and here here oh ah yes so the ATSPI ecosystem um, so there's ATSPI which is like the protocol and the finger magics that defines how applications can be manipulated from the outside um, there's one super important tool that's called Exerciser. It basically allows you to introspect what's going on inside ATSPI. And it's super important because we need to be able to find out what ATSPI actually sees of the application. I will show you in a minute what that looks like. And of course we have the application. The application needs to implement ATSPI, which de facto means that every application has it because it's in the toolkit. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So let's look at an exerciser. Is there another slide? Oh, there's another slide. Exerciser. Let's hope nothing crashes. Ooh. You don't see it, but something crashed. No, no, no. Oh, wait. So this is. Exerciser. It's essentially a debugging tool for all intents and purposes. And we can look, actually, let's open kcalc because kcalc is kind of simple. So we have kcalc open. And it almost appeared automatically. <laughs> so now we can look at what ATSPI sees of kcalc. So there's like a super frame of the entire window, apparently. Then we have a filler, a status bar, a menu a bar, a toolbar, and another filler. Um, I'm going to guess that the main toolbar is going to be interesting. No, it's not. It has undo, redo, cut, and copy. But like we could execute these actions right now. I'm going to look for something more exciting. So one of the problems is with our current uh, accessibility structures is we have lots of noise items, right? Like you can see that there are items that say nothing and they, are, they, they have no actual function. They are just there because automatically they are injected. And we as developers really should remove items that we do not need so they don't clutter up uh, the ATSPI bus, they don't clutter up exerciser, they don't consume resources. Um, so yeah, let's take a look. So this thing here is probably the result display. Let's have a look. Uh, no, nope. yes. So these are the properties of the thing that we are looking at. And apparently, we are looking at the hex display. So this is like an ID that is auto-generated inside Qt of like every Q object that we have. And it's based on the Q object name, I think. Also, the classes are mixed in. It's a bit magic what's going on, but it doesn't really matter because usually you set your object name to something and then it shows up here and then you can go, this is my object name, please find this object. So we have a bunch of displays here, right, because, so that's again one of these, um, these problems where we show something that we shouldn't be showing. We're currently displaying all the different uh, result uh, displays. So like decimal, binary, uh, octal, whatnot. We're displaying all of them in ATSPI even though in the UI there's only one open, right? So that's confusing and that's also confusing for accessibility reasons because obviously these are all getting enumerated. This is really the worst example, isn't it? Ah, <laughs> I found the buttons. <laughs> okay, so um, currently it says zero. Let's make it say seven, apparently. Um, so we're going to scroll down here, go into action. Then it doesn't want to scroll anymore. Here we go. Okay, let's press this action, perform this action. And it says seven, magic. And so what I've done manually is also what the web driver essentially does, right? It looks through the ATSPI table and looks for the element that makes the most sense for the description that we have, and then it executes an action on it. The actions can be varied. So here we have a press action, so a set focus action. There could also be a toggle action. There could be actually 
any action. Uh, it's not specified what actions need to be available. So you can have like a rotate by 90 degrees action if you want to. And let's exercise. Uh, okay, um, let me try to recover my slides. This is only going to take five minutes, maybe. Almost there. I see a progress bar. Almost there. Oh, come on. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Okay. So we've been here. We've been here. We've looked at this. We've looked at the code. I hope you found the code exciting. Really, that was like the main thing I wanted to have. Uh, <laughs> but so the, the, the only reason why I'm even giving this talk is because I need your help, right? I need you to write the code. Or, just as good, write test scenarios. So not necessarily the code, but write something down that someone can turn into code. So like, open this application, click on the menu bar, click on the file open thingamajigs, a dialog opens, click on this thing. It's a bit tedious, but once we have this set up, then we just need to maintain it. So we need to push through this initial hurdle of, ah, oh, it's so much work and it's boring. But once we do, it's going to be amazing. And that concludes my talk. Questions? Ooh, ah, so many questions. Gee. Why does your boringly simple calculator test that calculates 7 plus 1 equals 8 contain the copyright of Microsoft? Uh, yes. <laughs> so the calculator test was actually derived from Microsoft. That is why, the, yeah. <laughs> Uh, related to this, I mean, this is exactly what you shouldn't test with UI tests that uh, the calculator calculates correctly. I mean, it's, it's a bit of an edge case because you want to see that the result is displayed, yeah. but you don't want to actually test the calculation. That is true, yeah. You should do that as a unit test. So you did this uh, web driver that mm -hmm. com translates from uh, Selenium, whatever, to ATSPI. Yep. You could have as well decided to not use ATSPI and use like the Q object model or something, yeah. right? Yeah. It so you, you did it on purpose, so uh, that yeah. we would kill two birds with a shot, or was it just like the most like one-to-one -one conversion? Like, is it because my fear is that the Selenium model and the ATSPI model doesn't necessarily match one with each other, or maybe it does? Mm -hmm. or? It matches fairly well. So, um, I mean, uh, a web application today has buttons and widgets and transformations and rotations and all this stuff, right? So they map fairly well. Um, but it was a conscious decision that this also brings us forward with accessibility. Uh, first of all, thank you. I, I did QA and I have done web UI tests for uh, Plasma. So, and a problem I've had is transient uh, image events. For example, the package gate updater uh, system tray indicator has like this dot that can stay, that it's basically info or like something happened and even can stay up for a while even after you install and I had problems with that. How does this handle transient events and uh, things that are not buttons or text like images. So how could you tell that uh, the package kit uh, indicate system tray indicator is in this state? Yeah, um, it can't. Maybe it can. I'm not sure that it can. Um, so in exerciser, there are like this dialog I showed you where I clicked on um, press the action, right? There are a lot of properties that you can set on accessibility elements that are not necessarily there, but there are usually ways to expose them. So it's probably a matter of us exposing the information through ATSPI so we can then use them in a test. Uh, also, uh, have you tried OpenQA? I have tried OpenQA. So, uh, oh, I didn't really go into this, but like the difference to OpenQA is that OpenQA is an image based test system, whereas this tests functionality, right? And so um, writing tests for them is also radically different because in the one you're basically creating images and say this is my reference and the what is on screen should look like my reference, whereas here you, you saw it, we are writing out the actual functional logic of if I click this button then this should happen. Uh, thanks a lot. I have so many questions. I'll ask them later. Uh, yeah. So as came up yesterday, this is great work for all three of KDE's current goals. Um, I was wondering for the sustainability emul user emulation aspect, um, do you have an idea of how demanding running Selenium tests is? Is it energy consuming itself? 
I haven't looked into it. I've given it a thought, but I haven't yet looked into it. Um, it's definitely something to, to look at, but it should not be that uh, resource intensive. Or uh, put another way, if it is, that is a bug. You have shown us four examples where things worked out. Do you also have an example where things go wrong? No, because obviously all our tests are amazing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so if things go wrong, they, um, this entire thing basically integrates with C tests. So when you run C tests, uh, it will also automatically run the Appium tests as long as you have the, the tech stack installed. And um, because it's integrated in C-Test, if it fails, it will just show up as a C-Test failure. Does that answer your question? Uh, so uh, are there any uh, plans? Uh, is this, I'm guessing this uh, integration is not uh, KDE specific. So uh, are there maybe any plans to upstream it into uh, Selenium proper as an extra backend for using um, other yeah. applications? Um, it is currently specific to Plasma because we're using Quinn Wayland. Um, there's possibly opportunity for upstreaming. Um, I haven't really given it any thought because because of Wayland, we need a bunch of custom code in inside the web driver. OK, also uh, another question. Um, I noticed uh, in one of the one of the scripts that uh, uh, a time-based wait uh, is applied before uh, actually testing. Is it uh, possible to somehow uh, do so asynchronously? Uh, I mean, without uh, waiting, let's say, 30 seconds, but rather when a signal uh, is raised before starting, and there's another signal uh, is raised at end at the end, uh, in order to not uh, depend on transient uh, events, which could uh, 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 which would throw things mm. off? Uh, I don't think so. So generally, it's a polling-based API that Selenium has with the web driver. Um, there may be, uh, so th there has been a new version of this spec for like a year. There may be something in there that actually does uh, a more interactive approach to the entire thing. So maybe. Hi. Um, so if running ctest also then runs, for example, the, the um, like the test to install a Flatpak package, mm -hmm. like this obviously depends, I guess, on Flatpak being installed on the host, and yep. and it also installs and uninstalls random yep. stuff on the host. Yeah. Is there any way to like make this more self-contained, so kind of to have like a fixed test environment also, not to depend on like random stuff and um, mess up random settings that you have? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's absolutely possible. Um, I opted not to do it by default because it makes testing more complicated. Because suddenly you need to spin up your entire environment within a confined space. So yeah, it's possible, but not by default. So uh, you said this runs on Kaelin Whalen, right? Yeah. Um, could it be possible in the future to use Selenium to test for X11 specific bugs? Because that's, a situ that's a, um, something yeah, I have so to deal it's, with. It's, it's possible. Um, there is an operation mode where it doesn't start up Quinn Wayland, but instead uses your existing session, then yeah, it's possible. Okay. It's not going to be pretty, though. I mean, especially if you want to crash your X server, then your session is gone. So that complicates matters a bit. But that is true. Hey, I don't like Python. Can I write it in another language? Oh, that's one of the amazing things of Selenium is you can write it in Ruby or Python or C Sharp or Java or, I don't know, C++ probably. OK, now I want my KDE application to be tested on Windows. And you said it's Queen Wayland specific. So how do I do that? you just use the Microsoft provided web driver. So if we go uh, back to the sequence diagram, if I can find it, this one, right? The web driver bit can be exchanged, right? That can be our web driver. It can be the Microsoft web driver. It can be an Android web driver. It can be an iOS web driver. They exist, yeah. They can be the same. So uh, the question was if the tests can be the same. Uh, the answer is, so the thing is, it depends on how you write your test, right? Like I've shown you how to write uh, um, like the uh, brackets, label, pipe, uh, some label play, for example. That is an uh, ATSPI specific notation. You can also just search for the name of the button, in which case your test is less precise, but will be portable to all platforms. Does that make sense? Right, cool. Thanks, Harald. Thank you.